my first memory of feeling totally and utterly powerless is of me standing on a wet, tar-paved schoolyard. I'm in grade school, and I've got my fist in the air, chanting. I'm chanting words of hate and words of death. The words pain me to say, and I want to float above my body. There's a teacher walking up and down the rows of girls, making sure our words are loud enough and that our uniforms are on properly. She yells at me to tighten my fist, and I feel my fingernails digging crescent moon shapes into my skin. My parents' advice rings like an urgent siren through my mind. Pretending is safe in Iran. We must pretend. I remember so desperately wanting to stop speaking the hateful words of others. And I felt so strongly that if we could all just speak our own words, we could change the world, shape it, better it. Moving to the West certainly gave me a lot more control over my world. But at first, the idea that a single immigrant girl could create massive change seemed like an absurd notion. I've come to learn, though. That each of you can create massive change in the world by perfecting just two core personality traits and utilizing two central tools, and I'd like to talk to you about those today. The first trait you need to succeed in life is the one that many of the speakers here discuss today. Whether you are a business person, a soldier, or a civil rights leader. And that's the ability to recover from setbacks and failures, unconditional determination to overcome resistance. A couple of years ago, a case landed on my desk that looked like a sure loser. But I'd never lost a case before, and I really liked this client, a great little company. My team came up with some legal theories that we thought might have a chance at succeeding. And we worked tirelessly for a year and a half. During the course of that time, we became convinced that if we worked hard enough and put on the case that we wanted to put on, that we could persuade the arbitrator to rule in our favor. Along came trial. I was working 15, 16 hour days. I was in the third trimester of my pregnancy with my fourth child. And we put on a beautiful case. Everything went according to plan, which never happens at trial. All the witnesses testified just as we'd expected them to. We got in all the evidence we needed to get into the record. And when the verdict came, we opened it up to read that we had lost. It was an actual, utter, and total failure. I learned something that day. I learned that you could do everything right and work really hard, and still sometimes you'll lose. I also learned that lawyers who have never lost a case aren't necessarily the greatest lawyers. They're just the lawyers who were too afraid to take on a difficult case. There is nothing wrong with failure. Life is full of it. Success is full of it. What builds your character and what pushes you forward to succeed in the long run is your ability to face it, overcome it, and move forward in spite of it. This young boy was bullied so severely that at one point he got thrown down a flight of steps and had his head bashed against the floor until he passed out. Later in life, he contracted the most virulent form of malaria, which initially went misdiagnosed, and he very nearly died. He grew up, though, to form one of the largest money transfer companies in the world. But the same week that Elon Musk sold PayPal for a fortune that brought his net worth to $100 million, his 10-week-old son died of sudden infant death syndrome. Elon went on to sink all of his life savings into a struggling new company, borrowing money from friends just to make the rent, and going pretty much broke. He almost had a nervous breakdown. But now Tesla. That once failing company is defining our vision for the future, and Elon Musk is a space explorer with five kids worth 13 billion dollars. 
This little girl used to huddle in the top bunk with her sisters, and they would wrap bed sheets around their necks to protect their skin from the rat bites. Worse than the vermin, though, was the hunger, the constant pain of hunger. And she used to devise little schemes just to get food, such as befriending a boy at school whose mother would bake her banana bread, or enrolling in a summer program for the free Kool-Aid and the snacks. She would even dive through dumpsters. But now Viola Davis is not only an Oscar winner, she's one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the entire world. But if you want to change the world for the greater good, if you really want to make it a better place, being determined isn't enough. You've also got to commit yourself to service. What's really, really frightening about the world right now is that it isn't more shockingly violent than it's ever been before. Actually, human history is fraught with the sins of mankind. It takes an extraordinary mindset to reset a path previously bound for injustice. The path to success, your path to success, can't be just about making money or being famous. It's got to include service. Service to your communities, but also service to the other, because actually that's how you'll create massive change. But in times of fear and uncertainty, the path of service to the other is the more difficult path. I learned this when I was 10 years old. I was playing in the basement of our apartment building with some of the neighbor kids. It was a very odd time and place to play because actually we were using the basement as a makeshift bomb shelter. I was in fourth grade, but school was canceled that day, as it was most times those days. Just too many rocket attacks into the city. My country was at war with Iraq. It was a 10-year bloody mess of a war that claimed a million lives on the Iranian side alone. And on that day, we had spent almost the entire day in the shelter. There were so many raids. But we were kids, you know? So in between the raids and when the red alert wasn't sounding, we would run around, play tag, push toy trucks so close for our dolls. I remember the jolting feeling and the thunderous sound when something hit. It hit so close that it shook the floor beneath my feet. It rattled the windows. And the plaster from the ceiling sprinkled on my head and on my nose. I dove into my parents' arms, screaming, damn those Iraqis, damn them all to hell. It was an understandable statement from a frightened child during a time of war and violence. But my father wouldn't stand for it. Later on, he sat me down and he said, I know you think they're the enemy, but they're oppressed by their government, just like we are. And we are all victims of the same war. It took me years to fully grasp the full extent of my father's wisdom, to figure out that true courage was understanding the universality of powerlessness and its impact on the deeds of our so-called enemies. There is so much fear in the world, and there is so much to be afraid of. And it's so easy to use the anxieties of everyone around you to push a course toward divisiveness or isolation. You must resist that temptation. To be change makers for the greater good, you've got to urge service to the other. So we've talked about two personality traits you will need to work on in order to become a change maker, determination and service. I'd like now to tell you some of the tools that will help you along that path. First, if you want to change the world, you've got to convince people who don't already agree with you to change their minds. Whether you are convincing a jury to find in favor of your client, or a group of citizens to vote for your politician, or mobilizing a community movement. You're selling. What I tell all young advocates is that there's two sides to every story. Your job as advocates is to convince the decision maker that your side is at least a little bit better than the other guy's side. So how do you do this? How do you go about selling? Well, the single best thing you can possibly do 
is to learn as much about your audience, the listeners, the decision makers, as you possibly can. What are they afraid of? What makes them feel safe? What makes them happy? What makes them sad? What is it that you could say that would make them turn around and walk away from you? And what is it that you could say that would make them stay and listen? And then you take this information and you tailor your arguments around the ethics of your audience. You ground it within their moral framework, not your own. I'll give you an example. There's some really excellent research out there that suggests political conservatives are primarily concerned with the ethics of patriotism, security, proportionality, whereas political liberals tend to have their morality much more grounded in equality and care. So if you want to convince a group of conservatives to allow more refugees into the country, you're far less likely to be successful by appealing to a supposed moral obligation of care. You're much more likely to be successful by talking about the American dream of the founding fathers and how more people should have access to that dream. Or the fact that America is safer if it has a central role at the table dealing with the global refugee crisis. Similarly, you want to convince liberal to, a liberal to increase military spending? Don't focus so much on American security interests. You're better off focusing on the possibility of eradicating poverty within that particular community. So it's not only OK, but actually essential to frame your arguments around your audience. But that should never be confused in a way that would allow you to do anything other than telling the truth. We must always stand against the moral degradation of lies as a tool of persuasion. Besides the moral obligation to tell the truth, we should remember lies eventually unravel. With enough time, the truth tends to come out, particularly in Western democratic societies with a free press, like this one. I'd like now to talk to you about the second tool at your disposal as global change makers, and that is the legal process itself. A few years ago, in 2009, a middle school teen named Marissa was found in school with a bunch of pills and a razor blade in her wallet. The vice principal asked her where she got the contraband, and she said, my friend Savannah gave it to me. Now, Savannah was an honor roll student with no prior history of substance abuse, or disciplinary problems. But the vice principal didn't ask any follow-up questions. He didn't ask, where was Savannah hiding them, or when did she give them to you? Instead, he just found Savannah, took her to the nurse's room, and proceeded to strip search her. When the strip search revealed nothing, Savannah was told she could put her clothes back on and go back to class. Now, what's really disturbing about this incident is that actually there's nothing illegal about what the vice principal did. In 2009, schools could strip search 13-year-old girls as long as they were suspected of illegal activity. The law is sometimes unjust. America is not perfect. In fact, our history is fraught with instances of oppression and inequality. What's really great, though, about living in a participatory democracy is that you can use the system to change the very injustices about that system. Savannah and her mother got help from us at the American Civil Liberties Union, which you might know as the ACLU. And together, we filed a lawsuit against the school, and we took the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where an eight to one majority ruled in favor of Savannah. This type of search now is illegal and unconstitutional. What's even better is you don't need a 100-year-old massive civil rights institution to change the law. You can actually change it today, sitting here right now, without a law degree. Shutescott Martinez is a 16-year-old climate activist and hip-hop artist. Angry about the impact of fracking on the environment and frustrated that the federal government wasn't doing enough to protect the atmosphere for future generations, 
he and some of his teenage friends decided to file a lawsuit. They sued the government. Their allegation was very simple, that the health and safety of citizens and the environment is more important than the interests of oil and gas companies. And so before giving a permit to a fracking company, the company should first demonstrate that their work won't negatively impact the health of citizens and the climate system. Not more than a few weeks ago, in a decision that shocked the oil and gas industry, a Colorado Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the teens. So I have four little children, ages six and under. They're really cute. A few months ago, I organized a kid march to coincide with peace marches around the country and the globe. A bunch of us from the neighborhood gathered our kids, helped them make their protest signs. You know, they said things that the kids wanted to say, like kids for kindness, or girls just want to have fundamental rights, or let love guide the way. And they marched up and down the streets of the neighborhood, you know, waving their signs, smiling from ear to ear. They were feeling powerful and empowered. But what really brought tears to my eyes wasn't just that they were chanting words of love instead of words of hate, but that they were chanting their words. There was no teacher or politician or soldier or religious leader telling them what to say, making them say things they didn't want to say. Their world, your world, is not free from wrong. But the difference about living in a democracy is that you can change the system using the system. Take it from someone who's lived on the other side of the world in a very different system. When you think about the fact that millions of people would literally give their lives to have their children be here in this room right now with us, the full scope of your power shows. I've talked to you today about a couple of traits and a couple of tools that will be instrumental in helping set your path toward being tomorrow's change makers. I've asked you to rise up after you're beaten and then rise again and speak louder. To refuse to give in to the basis of human frailties, violence, fear, division, and to push forward for a better world than the one you entered. I've urged you to consider the perspective of the other side before imparting your message. And I've told you that you can change the injustices of our system by using the system itself and that you have the power to make those changes today. Yehuda Bauer, a Czech-born Israeli historian, once stood in front of the German Federal Assembly. And he said, I come from a people who gave the Ten Commandments to the world. The time has come to strengthen them by adding three more, which we ought to adopt and commit ourselves to. Thou shalt not be a perpetrator. Thou shalt not be a victim. And thou shalt never, but never, be a bystander. So it's in your hands now, and you must ask yourself, will I sit and watch it all unravel? Or will I stand? and help to bend the arc of history for a better tomorrow. Will you stand up? Thank you.